You remember where the road comes to the beach from Southport? Well, just before you get there, every cottage has been demolished. Uh, there are very few timbers left. It's complete ruination. It was a whopping storm, and it was moving so quickly. That was a bad storm. <laughs> I will tell you it was. It was like Big Bad Leroy Brown, boy. That was the worst one, I'll tell you that. Hopefully, that's the worst one we'll ever have. When Hurricane Hazel hit North Carolina on October 15, 1954, I was a corporal in the Army assigned to field artillery and stationed at Fort Benning, Georgia. I didn't experience Hazel firsthand, but I remember reading about it in letters from home. And I'll never forget seeing the pictures later on. Like most North Carolinians, I could not believe the devastation. Hazel was one of the most devastating hurricanes ever to hit the United States and by almost any measure, the worst storm ever to hit North Carolina. Fifty years later, people still talk about Hazel. Mr. Sandman. No one has a claim on me. In October 1954, President Eisenhower was running for re-election. Marilyn Monroe was divorcing baseball star Joe DiMaggio and on the waterfront was playing in theaters. Stella! Here in North Carolina, Governor William B. Umstead was battling a serious illness. Teams in the new Atlantic Coast Conference were playing football. And, your magic and at the beach, the fall fishing season was gearing up. On Long Beach, Jerry and Connie Helms were enjoying their honeymoon. It was a good time, going to the beach and being with your friends, that was the thing you wanted to do. Over in Southport, Hoyle Dosher was running his charter fishing business. In 1954, the industry in this town was fishing or shrimping. If you didn't do one or the other, you had to go someplace else. Leela and Dallas Piggott were running their shrimping business and wouldn't think of living anywhere else. And I will say that I don't know of a better place in the world to grow up than Southport. It was just wonderful. Up in Moorhead City, Tony Seaman was a teenager working in his father's seafood restaurant called The Sanitary. Daddy started me out in, in the fish market, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed working. About 900 miles south of Moorhead City, at the Weather Bureau's Miami office, Grady Norton was hard at work, too. He was the chief weather forecaster. Norton was monitoring a trough of low pressure in the tropics. In 1954, of course, we hadn't even reached outer space, so we had no satellites. Norton relied mostly on ship reports. On October the 5th, they told of a storm with 95 mile an hour winds off the Caribbean island of Grenada. While Norton was tracking the storm, now called Hazel, he had a stroke and died. He had been working long hours and under a lot of stress to track Hurricane Hazel. Hazel turned to the north. Forecasters tried to pick up where Norton had left off. They were scrambling for information. There wasn't much. There really wasn't much. And what there was came by teletype. We were severely handicapped compared to what we have now. On October 12th, Hazel slammed into Haiti with winds of more than 125 miles per hour. And the rainfall from Hazel caused tremendous floods that, uh, that swamped entire villages. The estimates were around 1,000 dead. Hazel lost a lot of its punch slamming into Haiti's mountains. It weakened to a tropical storm, but it was heading toward the Bahamas. Even for October, the water stays very warm there, and the conditions were just right for Hazel to to blossom back up to become a major hurricane. It did just that. Forecasters began monitoring the storm more closely, clocking winds of more than 100 miles per hour as it passed the Bahamas. Hoyle Dosher started to see the big swells in the ocean while out on his fishing trips. We'd know two or three days ahead of a storm, a big storm, because of the sea conditions. But most people knew little or nothing about Hazel's approach. This was the tiny article in Raleigh's paper the morning of October 14th. 
the headline in Wilmington's morning paper that same day. Finally, Wilmington's afternoon paper sounded the alarm just hours before the storm's arrival. Largely, the people in North Carolina were not prepared for Hazel. Are we cool front moving? Few had TVs, and the information in TV and radio reports was too old to rely on. And uh, the latest report, the hurricane moving north. Sometime your forecast was maybe 10 or 15 hours or a day behind. On October 15th at 8 a.m., Hazel was 95 miles east of Charleston, South Carolina, and heading north. It was a Category 4 hurricane with 140 mile per hour winds. It was moving fast, and it was approaching on a high lunar tide. All the ingredients were there for a, a perfect strike in the area. On the eve of Hurricane Hazel, many people in North Carolina went to bed thinking the storm was still a long way off. And since none of them had experienced a storm of that intensity, they went to bed without worrying about it very much. But Hazel was a wake-up call in many ways. I mean, I could see the ocean and see the white caps on the ocean from this far away. On October 14th, Connie and Jerry Helms were honeymooning at her parents' cottage on Long Beach. They had heard a radio report about a hurricane near the Bahamas, but paid little attention to it. That night, rain canceled their plans to go to a drive-in movie. The outer bands of the storm was already on us. We just didn't know that. Connie and Jerry went to bed. The sound of objects blowing around on the porch woke them up early in the morning. Connie started packing. When I looked out that window and I could actually see the white caps and the ocean billowing up above the dunes, I knew we were in trouble. Jerry went out for a closer look. And the wind was blowing, the water was coming over the dunes, it started to cross the road, and I, so I went back and I told her, just forget the packing, let's get in the car and go. So you were living in, on the second floor, second floor of this house. That's right. Wife and two little children. That's right. Over in Southport, Hoyle Dosher took his family to the nearby Kate Stewart house. It was on the waterfront, just like his. But it had been there 150 years, and we figured it'd stay a little bit longer. Then Dosher and his crew took his fishing boats two miles up a creek to protect them from the storm. While he was securing the boats, Dosher noticed marsh hens fleeing into the woods to escape the rising water. That's when I told the men on the boats that I just had to go. I had to go look after my family. Hoyle headed down the street toward the waterfront, wading through thigh-high water and ducking behind oak trees to avoid flying debris. When I went down that street and the Wells Shrimp House was going to pieces, that tin was coming up that street and there'd be, some of it be banging down the street, some of it 10 feet in the air. Hoyle got back to the Kate Stewart house and found it flooded. There was clothes floating around. I never will forget. There was a dresser floating around with clothes all over the place in it. And uh, I checked the house out and knew they had left. There was no one there. There was no one there when I went in that house. Leela Piggott's husband had ignored her warnings about the storm. While he slept, she watched the storm through a window. Suddenly, she noticed a shrimp boat heading straight for her house. Well, about the time I was standing there in shock, all of a sudden, my husband came in, and I, he grabbed my arm, and he pulled me so hard I fell on the floor. And he dragged me into the dining room. He said, you're going to get killed. That boat's coming in the window. I said, I know it. I was watching it. Up in Moorhead City, Tony Seaman's father closed his restaurant early. We went back out to the house and stayed to the house until the storm came, and it rained like you know what. At Long Beach, the water was already too high for the Helms to get off the island in their car. So they headed for the nearest two-story house. And by the time we got there, the water was waist deep or chest deep and getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And the wind was picking up pretty good too. The Helms broke into the house and watched the destruction outside. All the houses along the ocean front were being torn apart because the water was rushing right through them. We actually thought that we were going to be rammed by floating houses. All we could do was watch and wait for the impact. 
But there was no more time to wait. We could feel the house was shifting and we were afraid that the floor was going to give away any minute and it was time for us to get out of there because nothing else anywhere as far as we could see was still standing except the house we were in. They tied themselves together with a blanket and grabbed a mattress to use as a raft. Water was coming in the second story window and the breakers were breaking over the top of the house. And uh, I said, we're level with the water and it's coming in and when the house goes, starts to fall over, we're going out this window, you get on the mattress and hold on that blanket. And when we got on the mattress, and all of a sudden it seemed like shoo, we were just gone. When Hurricane Hazel hit, Tony Seaman and his dad were worried about their restaurant. Leela and Dallas Piggott were worried about their shrimping business. Hoyle Dosher was worried about his wife and kids. And Connie and Jerry Helms were worried about each other. After all, they were riding a storm surge that was two stories high on a mattress. We put the mattress out of the second story window on the water. On the water, that's right. The Helms mattress snagged the top of an oak tree along the back side of the island. The only thing we could do at that point was keep our heads down and stay as low and as close to the mattress as possible because there were things just flying all through the air. We got pounded by two by fours and shingles and anything that could be picked up by the wind and dropped, we got pounded by it. It was like a tide in here that the, the water was so strong. In Moorhead City, Tony Seaman Sr. decided to take his son and go check on the restaurant. They drove through a couple of flooded creeks on the way. And one of them we had to open the door to, to let water get in the car so it wouldn't wash us off on the other side. Uh, it was that strong. The rising water stopped them a block short of the restaurant. Tony waded through waist deep water and stepped behind a building to shield himself from the wind. Every time I stuck my head around the corner of this building, it would blow me down. So I submerged like a turtle and got on a cross and got up to the building and, and took the key, opened the door and looked in and could see things floating around in there. Back on Long Beach, the wind had died and the rain had stopped. I saw the sky and I saw the sun peek through. And in my mind, I was looking at the sun for the last time. The water began to recede. The island started coming up out of the ocean, just rising up. Connie and Jerry climbed down the tree and made their way back towards the beach. It was overwhelming to see what had happened there. There was nothing. All the structures were gone. It was barren. Meanwhile, Connie's parents had driven down to Long Beach to check on her. The National Guard stopped them at the bridge. And she said, well, you'll have to shoot me. My baby's, my on. baby's on this beach and I'm going to look for him. When we got close to him and, and her mother recognized us, uh, she just fainted right there on the beach. Hoyle Dosher found his family safe and sound at a house on higher ground. Boy, you're talking about a relief to find them. That shrimp boat hit Leela and Dallas Pickett's house. It survived and so did they. But the same can't be said of their shrimp business. Our shrimp house, we lost it. It was gone. Even the dock, I wonder when the dock left. It did tremendous damage to all the, the boats docks, structures, houses. We did have to do a lot of rebuilding in this town, I'll tell you that. All 20 of Southport's shrimp houses and fuel docks were destroyed. In Moorhead City, the holes the Siemens had cut in the restaurant floor to keep it from floating off its pilings were letting water drain back out. They connected to a nearby generator and cleaned up the mess. The sanitary was the only restaurant in the area open for business the next day. We fed all kinds of people. They, everybody, everybody had their shoulder to the wheel doing the same thing. Then we're coming near the bridge, and here there's real devastation. WPTF Radio's Carl Gertsch delivered one of the first reports of Hazel's aftermath from a DC-3. Everything is gone. Here's what he saw in Long Beach. Ladies and gentlemen, I thought we'd seen some of the bad effects of the hurricane. There were hundreds of houses here. Long Beach is completely flattened out. We can see signs of the houses 
a hundred yards back from the beach where they were washed over there and where they've assumed crazy tilting positions now. Not the sign of a cottage here where there was a long row of them before. The highway is completely ruined. Hazel's strongest winds, those in the upper right quadrant, hit the Brunswick County Barrier Islands broadside. And at 25 miles per hour, Hazel's forward speed was unusually fast when it hit. If it's rolling fast, you're gonna get a much higher storm surge because you can push up a bigger wall of water in front of it. With that wall riding atop the high lunar tide, the storm surge rose to 18 feet. Really the highest storm tides ever recorded in North Carolina. There were 357 cottages on Long Beach before Hazel. Only five were left after, and they were severely damaged. 10 people were killed on Brunswick beaches, nine of them in Ocean Isle when the truck they were in was swept away by the storm surge. The surge at Carolina and Wrightsville beaches reached 13 to 15 feet. At Carolina, 362 buildings were destroyed and 288 suffered major damage. Scores and scores of boats that have been washed up on the highway. At Wrightsville, 89 buildings were destroyed and 155 were severely damaged. From Topsail Island to Moorhead City, the storm surge reached 8 to 12 feet. That still is a very significant storm surge, uh, particularly for the Barrier Island communities. 210 of Topsail Island's 230 homes were destroyed and the island's drawbridge was swept away. There was extensive damage on up the coast to Sneeds Ferry, Swansboro, and the beach communities along Onslow Bay. Moorhead City saw gusts of 100 miles per hour even though the center of the storm passed about 90 miles to the west. Hazel's eye tracked just east of the path Hurricane Franz took in 1996, passing between Raleigh and Rocky Mount. That meant that all of eastern North Carolina was on that powerful right side of the storm. Towns like Kinston, Goldsboro, Greenville, and Wilson, where trees were blown down and roofs torn off buildings. Winds gusted at 110 miles an hour at Fayetteville's airport and 90 at Raleigh's. The people of Raleigh had no clue uh, what they were about to experience. Just like Fran, trees crashed down on houses, cars, and power lines all over town. It only took Hazel six hours to pass through North Carolina. During that time, it killed 19 people and injured 200 more. It destroyed 15,000 homes and other buildings and damaged 39,000. The damage was estimated at $136 million. Today, that would be close to 10 billion. But Hazel still had more to do. It huffed through Virginia and Pennsylvania with a forward speed of about 50 miles an hour. Wind gusts of 100 miles per hour were measured in, in Philadelphia, of all places. Hazel joined a low pressure system in western New York State and caused flash floods in Toronto that killed nearly 80 people. It finally dissipated near Scandinavia. When it was finished, Hazel had killed more than 600 people. Hazel was a long-lived hurricane uh, that left a trail of destruction from start to finish. It left a question too, will there be another one? Scientists say hurricanes are part of a natural cycle that helps stabilize global temperatures. So yeah, we, we could certainly be hit again, and, and we will. The question is when. If it's not a question of if we get hit by another hazel, but when, then perhaps the question ought to be, are we ready for it? Most people agree that we're better prepared than we were in 1954, but we have yet to be tested again by a storm that strong. And since then, a lot has changed, for better and for worse. Already have watches out for the island of Jamaica. Jamaica. We've gone from ship reports to satellite images and from teletypes to the internet. We're far better able to model how, how these hurricanes are developing and where they're expected to go. We now have Hurricane Francis. Just and now that information gets to the public immediately. Very well-developed storm. People are far more aware now 
of the subtlest nuance going on in the tropical waters out there. How are y'all doing? Just Emergency fine. management officials are better prepared. Than that, and they're not going to let anybody down on the uh, 12. Every hurricane we have, we learn lessons. We, we sharpen our skills. Coastal homes are being built higher and stronger. But does it make them hurricane proof? No, it doesn't. There's far more coastal development than there was 50 years ago, putting many more people and their homes in harm's way. Hazel in 2004 would be orders of magnitude larger consequence. Any category four, five storm is gonna be catastrophic. Hazel was the only category four hurricane to hit North Carolina in the 20th century. They don't come around very often, but they do come. There will be another, but never another Hazel. The National Weather Service retired the name. For more on Hazel, go to WRAL.com and click on Storm Tracker.